In this video, I wanted to talk about non-monophyletic groups and present a case study using primates. In taxonomy, there are generally two ways that we can group things. We can group things as monophyletic groups. These are groups that recognize the evolutionary ancestry and the ancestors of the taxa, or we can group things non-monophyletically which basically means we're grouping things based on similarities and we are ignoring some aspect of the evolution, the actual evolutionary history. Currently, monophyletic groups are favored by most evolutionary biologists, taxonomists, phylogeneticists. There's still some discussion about this. Um, but often many of, the, many of the, the taxonomic groups that we have been taught or that we are comfortable with um, have been shown using genetics to be non-monophyletic which is uh, problematic because they're ignoring uh, evolutionary history. Now there's two types of non-monophyletic groups that there's at least two types of non-monophyletic groups, two commonly recognized types of non-monophyletic groups, polyphyletic and paraphyletic. The differences can be somewhat subtle and hard to grasp. For my course, I'm not interested in whether you can actually tell the difference. What's more important is that you can recognize when something is a good monophyletic group or when it is a non-monophyletic group. For the sake of this talk, I am going to talk about polyphyly versus paraphyly, but um, in my class, I'm not going to draw a distinction. To be honest, there are times when I get turned around trying to tell polyphyly from paraphyly. But I'll use, I'll, I will discuss the difference between them because it's useful for really honing in your understanding of phylogenetic trees. Paraphyly is also more common. Some people, I think, won't even use the term polyphyletic. Um, Non-monophyletic um, is probably the best term. It's, it encompasses both cases. So polyphyletic, paraphyletic groups um, have an ancestor um, and some, but not all, of its descendants. Again, you don't. For my class, you don't need to actually remember that exact definition. You just need to recognize when not a non-monophyletic group has been um, has been created. So reptiles are not a clade. They're not monophyletic. They are paraphyletic because reptiles includes crocodiles, snakes, and lizards, and turtles, but it excludes birds. It excludes birds and avian dinosaurs, even though our most uh, refined methods have for a long time revealed that birds um, are dinosaurs and birds and dinosaurs are closely related to crocodiles. So these sister groups um, um, this, this relationship is ignored, birds are kicked out, and because of their current simil obvious similarities, or maybe maybe superficial similarities, uh, that we group them as uh, reptiles. However, what we have here is a paraphyletic group. We're grouping together all of these taxa and its common ancestors. All these taxa emerge from some sort of reptile-like ancestor at some time. So we're grouping together these taxa and its ancestors, but we're ignoring one of the descendants of this ancestor. So there's this ancestor back here represented by this node. We go through time. We eventually reach these splits. We're including crocodiles in the reptile group, but we're ignoring birds. So we're kicking out birds from the family reunion from the clade, even though they are closely related to crocodiles. That results in a non-monophyletic group, um, in particular paraphyly. So, in this uh, in this video for discussing non monophyletic groups, um, paraphyly and also polyphyly, I'll be talking about lemurs, tarsiers, and lorises, and a uh, taxonomic group known as simians and prosimians that um, is no longer. I was taught it when I was in school. It's no longer, I believe, as in wide use because prosimians has turned out to be um, paraphyletic. So lemurs, they occur only in Madagascar. They are primate. They are a relative of monkeys and apes, but they're more distantly related. We've known that for a long time using, um, using anatomical evidence. Tarsiers are nocturnal primates of Southeast Asia, and they are, they are interesting because they have these very huge eyeballs. In fact, when you look at their brain, their eyeballs are actually bigger than their brains. They have these huge, huge eyes. This is their brain and the brain stem. So eyeballs bigger than their brains. They're nocturnal. They're active at night. And these huge eyes facilitate 
um, capturing limited light and allowing them to see. Lemurs are also typically nocturnal, or many of them are nocturnal, but they don't have these outrageously huge eyes. I found this quote. Uh, I just think it's funny. Uh, it talks about how Tarsier is a bizarre lemur-like primate that looks like a squirrel from Mars on an LSD, um, LSD trip. And that about sums up, I think, these um, kind of funny-looking, cool little guys. Um, squirrel, a Martian squirrel on an LSD trip. Lorises are a similar-looking species. They're nocturnal, not the loris from Game of Thrones. Their eyeballs are not as outrageously proportioned, but they do have very large eyes. So we'll be considering in this video four different primate groups, the lemurs, the, tar the, the uh, tarsiers, and the lorises, and then primates, or excuse me, monkeys. We're not going to be so concerned with monkeys. So roughly we could divide these up, and just by looking at anatomy, we can say we have monkeys and not monkeys. And we can group... Uh, or traditionally, we have grouped the Tarsiers and the Lorises together because they're nocturnal and they're Asian and they have relatively large eyes. Lemurs tend to be nocturnal, but they don't have as large eyes. And they're also in Africa. They're in Madagascar. So it's tempting to group the Tarsiers and the the Tarsiers and Lorises together, and maybe we might even put them on a phylogenetic tree like this, where we put. Um, Tarsiers and lorises more closely related to each other than they are to lemurs. And uh, in this case, I put them more closely related to monkeys, but perhaps we want to put them more close. It'd be probably better to have put them more closely, link them this direction with the uh, lemurs. However, it turns out the improved uh, evidence, particularly genetic indi evidence, indicates Tarsiers and lorises, despite uh, both living in the same part of the world, despite having large eyes and being nocturnal and having various similarities, are not a clade. They are not each other's closest living relatives. We actually should link together lorises and lemurs together as sister groups. And then this should be crossed out here. This clade here um, should not be here. But um, Lorises are, excuse me, tarsiers are actually more closely related to monkeys than they are to lor, um, lorises or lemurs. So this is a more accurate phylogenetic tree here. Here's a tree that encompasses all of them. So we have humans, apes here. Um, we can add monkeys to here. So these are monkeys and our apes. These have been traditionally called simians or simiaforms. And then down here, we have lemurs, uh, lorises, and tarsiers. This blue here, this encompasses lemurs, lorises, and tarsiers. And then lorises and tarsiers um, at times have been grouped together because of their similarity. So that's indicated by the red. So we have one group, the blue group, lemur, lorises, and tarsiers. And then the red group, just lorises and tarsiers. So again, we're going to use lemurs, lorises, and tarsiers to talk about paraphyly and polyphyly. Those are two ways of being non-monophyletic, but we're going to be mostly just concerned that it's their non-monophyletic. So lemurs plus lorises plus tarsiers, they would be non-monophyletic. We can draw a circle around here. We have a some taxa we have their common ancestor but we're excluding these descendants of that common ancestor so we're cutting them off from the the tree so these three taxa together lemurs lorises and tar tarsiers they are paraphyletic because we're we've got a group we've got its common ancestor down here but we're ignoring some of the descendants of that common ancestor lorises and tarsiers if we just include them because they're um, similarities, they uh, turn out to be polyphyletic because we are ignoring um, we are uh, ignoring the the evolutionary history, and I'll unpack that in a second. So again, monophyletic groups they include the common ancestor and all of the descendants. So we have an ancestor here, and we're going to include all of the descendant taxa. So there's some ancestor in the past here represented by this node. It's uh, Progeny taxa include old world monkeys, new world monkeys, apes, and humans. These are the simians, simiaforms. They're monophyletic and they form a clade. However, the prosimians are paraphyletic. Um, that's because this group includes a, 
a, the ancestor here, the lemurs, the lorises, and the tarsiers, but it's excluding all of these descendants. It's focusing on the similarities of this group here, and it's ignoring the fact that these um, these taxa all descend from the same common ancestor as these here. Another example of a, a paraphyletic group are wasps. So this green here shows all the taxa that are associated with wasps. However, ants and bees evolved from uh, both evolved from wasps, and they are generally recognized as separate taxa. However, um, creating a group of just wasps um, ignores these evolutionary relationship. It cuts them off artificially, even though they share common ancestors. So focusing on the similarities of all of the wasps ignores the facts that bees um, are closely related, ants are closely related and share a common ancestor. So polyphyletic groups, um, they can be a little complicated to wrap your head around. It's more important to just know that they're um, non-monophyletic. But there are groups that are descendants. Um, they are uh, taxa where certain descendants are included in a group but not their common ancestors. So in this case, we've circled just lorises and tarsiers, but um, their ancestors um, are excluded because this ancestor would be relatively lemur-like. This ancestor would be um, different than either of them. Um, it's kind of a hard, I can get uh, turned around exactly identifying polyphyletic groups. Um, the biggest thing here is that they are defined by a certain trait, which is large eyes. They're being grouped together by large eyes and um, nocturnalness. And the fact that they occur in Asia, they're being grouped together by these traits that just happen to be convergently evolved. Lorises um, evolved from a common ancestor with lemurs. They just so happen to um, end up in Asia and to evolve large eyes. Tarsiers evolved from a common ancestor with monkeys and apes. They are more closely related to monkeys and apes, that would be over here, than they are to lorises. But they just so happen to have ended up in Asia and to evolve large eyes. So they converged on um, a similar uh, range. They converged on a similar uh, morphology. Um, the sim this are just morphological similarities and autonomical similarities are not similarities due to evolutionary relationships. Lemurs are more closely related to lorises than they are tarsiers, and tarsiers are more closely related to um, primates and to monkeys. So again, we have this ancestor here, um, and uh, the descendants are cut off from it. So something to consider is to look at a tree of bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes, and to consider why is um, for the term prokaryotic, um, what's wrong with it as a taxonomic group. And if you really want to dig in, you can see if you can um, do some a little bit of research on your own and perhaps find out why the term eukaryote might be a little bit problematic. If you are interested in better understanding the differences between paraphyly and polyphyly. You can look up some of these resources. They will also be in the dashboard for the course. Um, there are some people who've uh, written up descriptions of how to tell these two apart. Again, I'm more interested in just knowing when something is not monophyletic.